Mountain bikes have a lot of technical things going on. You've got hydraulic brakes, you've got moving bearings in the form of headsets, bottom brackets, rotational bearings with your wheel hubs. You've got shock absorbers, you've got pivots. There are loads of things going on. And for that reason, it can be quite easy to misdiagnose problems or even simply misunderstand things, especially when marketing terms can be quite confusing at times. So I'm gonna break down some of these and put them to bed right now. Okay, first up is actually more of a problem. So this is when your headset feels loose, but it actually isn't. So your headset, of course, are the bearings that are housed in the head tube of the bike. They're responsible for your steering. Uh, if your bearings are loose, that means things can rattle around. That is not good. And if your bearings are tight, of course, the bearings are being constricted and your steering will be very heavy, almost indexed sometimes. Uh, you can actually feel the notches of the bearings. Again, not good. What you're looking for is a bearing to be preloaded nicely so it spins without hindrance or movement and it does its job with no movement. Now there are a lot of things that can cause movement on the bike that can feel like a loose headset when in fact your headset is not the problem. The first one might be the bushings on the inside of your fork. Now forks are telescopic design, it has an outer leg, it has an inner leg and of course they slide on bushings. Now if those bushings are older or worn or even in fact on a new fork there's going to be an element of front like fore and aft flex or movement. It will be a minute amount. The older the fork gets the more notchy that's going to feel. Now a good way of feeling if it is this part of the bike is putting the front brake on, have your bike on the ground and you can feel if the headset's loose by moving it backwards and forwards, you'll actually feel some movement on the top or the bottom here. But also you can do the same at the fork. If you just put your hand around it, and I say you're doing it like this rather than leaning on a bike, because the second you lean on a bike and do it, you can actually compress the fork and that can add another thing in that can be confusing. So you may get a little bit of play here, like a very small amount isn't really a problem. There has to be an amount of movement there in order for them to move up and down. Otherwise, there'll be too much binding going on. Now, of course, if there's a lot of movement, then perhaps you want to get on the phone to your local bike shop or your local suspension tuner because you may need a proper fork service. Now, something else that's a characteristic thing that it can be would be your actual wheel axle is not completely tight. Of course, that sends alarm bells ringing with safety, so definitely check this. If you have an Allen key bolt, do it up to the correct torque setting. If you have any form of quick release lever, anything like that, make sure it's in the position that is marked as safe for that style unit. There's various different ones and they all come with a little tag just to let you know that. Now onto more of a safety one, make sure your caliper bolts are tightened up properly and I do recommend using some sort of thread lock on those threads to make sure they can't rattle loose. Remember, these are just bolts. They're not invincible on a bike. It's not the fault of a component if a bolt comes loose, but it's entirely possible for a bolt to come loose in the off-road environment. However, there is still one more thing it could be. And this is something that is always missed by people. And that is your actual brake pads moving around minutely inside the actual brake unit itself. If you can see here, just moving the bike very, very slowly and you'll see the fins on the pads moving a very small amount. Sometimes they can rattle, sometimes you can feel this in the headset and it will make it feel as if your headset is loose. So just because your headset feels loose, it doesn't necessarily mean it is. Okay, next up, um, this one's a bit more of a, a rubbish myth to be honest. Long bikes don't go around corners utter rubbish. Um, I ride long bikes, I've ridden much longer bikes. Henry's got a ridiculously long bike at the moment and so is Rich over on GMBN and they can get around corners just fine. You just have to recalibrate the way you think about approaching the turn. Now this is nothing technical on a bike thing. A long wheelbase bike will get around the same turn that a short wheelbase bike will. You just have to ride it a bit differently. Think of the difference of perhaps, I don't know, a compact car like a VW Polo and a long wheelbase transit van. Yeah, all right, so you first get in the transit van, you might feel a bit like, oh God, I'm never gonna get around there. You just have to think about it. You have to maybe swing out a little early in order to get your rear wheels comfortably around that turn. It's just the same on a long wheelbase bike. You just have to rethink how you ride. And to a degree, a long wheelbase mountain bike will actually make the most of a turn as opposed to a short wheelbase bike where you could actually ride the correct line, might be around the outside using some of that, it might be around the inside, but because of the fact you can take that inside line all the time, you might end up actually just defaulting to that. Whereas the longer bike is actually gonna force you to come out wide and give yourself more space. More space means a quicker exit. So technically it could be better. 
Now this one always makes me chuckle. Um, dry lube isn't actually dry. Yeah, believe it or not, there are two main types of lube, okay? There's lots of subcategories. We're just gonna look at wet lube and dry lube here. Now both of them are liquid based. Uh, one is a wet lube, it's designed for wet conditions. One is a dry lube and it's designed for dry conditions. Now the fundamental differences between them are the wet lube is a much thicker, more viscous liquid. The idea of that is it's very water repellent and when you put it on your chain, it stays in place. The lubricating particles get into the chain and they stay there. The downside is muck and grit can stick to it. However, if you're riding in wet conditions, you need that protection, you need that constant lubrication. So you'll need a wet lube. A dry lubricant, however, the actual wet bit in a dry lube is not the lubricant. That is just a solvent carrier. That is just designed for application to get those lubricating particles into the rollers and the pins of the chain, and then they'll evaporate, hence leaving it as a dry lubricant afterwards, so other stuff doesn't stick to the chain. So if you just sit here, I'm pouring a wet lube and a dry lube on the worktop, and they, yeah, they look wet but one is wet and one isn't. Okay, another golden one here. Uh, 27 and a half inch wheels are not in fact actually 27 and a half. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, the correct measurement technically on paper is 650B, which is a French measurement. Okay, so we're well familiar with 26 inch wheels and this is roughly how it works. A 26 inch wheel is actually about 22 inch. You've got to add on to that a couple of inches on either side for your tire. The 26 refers to the outside diameter of a wheel with a typical tire on it. 29 inch, of course, you know where we're going with that. 27 and a half actually is nearer to a 26 inch wheel than it is to a 29 inch wheel. A 26 inch wheel uh, will actually be a 559 millimeter rim. So that's actually 22 inches, not the 26. Obviously you've got to add into the tire sizes to make it 26. The 27 and a half is actually 584 millimeters. That's only 23 inch. It doesn't really sit in the middle of the two wheel sizes, the 26 and the 29. So 591 millimeters would be exactly in the middle of 559 and 622, which is 29 inch. Confused? Yep, it's one of those things. And if you're wondering why this happened, 650 was actually around many years ago. The B refers to the tire itself. The 650 is the outside measurement. Uh, it was always there. And, and actually we just repurposed it for use on mountain bikes and it ended up being roughly in the middle of 26 and 29 inch wheels. And that's why the industry decided it was easier to refer to them as 27 and a half uh, for argument's sake, because having 26 inch, uh, you're talking the whole metric imperial thing, it's a bit confusing. 26, 650B and 29 doesn't really sound right. 26, 27 and a half and 29 is much better. Uh, but there you go, 27 and a half isn't actually 27 and a half. It's nearly 27 and a half. Okay, now something we often hear people talk about is, why does my chain come off when I pedal backwards? Now the purists out there might just say, well, you should be pedaling forwards because that's what you do on a bike. However, there are occasions where you might want to just go half a revolution backwards and if your chain comes off, that can be a problem. Now the instant solution around this sort of thing might be just to put a chain guide on the front and that might sort the problem. But there are a few reasons this can happen. Now there's no need to think your bike is broken. It's not. Sometimes this does just happen on bikes. The prime version of that would be if you have multiple chain rings on your front of your bike. If you have a double or a triple setup, the combination of crossing gears means your chain line will not be perfect. It might be okay pedaling forwards, but because of the shifting ramps on those chain rings and to a degree on the cassette at the rear, sometimes your chain will actually derail when you pedal backwards. The straighter in line, i.e. big to small or middle to middle or small to big, you can get the least likelihood that is of happening. Of course, it's gonna be very different on each independent bike. And then of course, there's the actual chain line, which refers to the length of the bottom bracket, how your chain rings actually line up with your sprockets. On a modern one by bike, like my one here, you'll see that the chain ring lines up almost completely central with the rear sprockets on the back of the bike. Now, because of that, the chain line is actually very good on both the lowest and the highest gear. It's designed to be used in all of those gears. Now I could pedal backwards in any one of those gears and my chain will not come off. Of course, there might be exceptions to this again. And those exceptions might be you've got a filthy transmission. So perhaps your chain might be a bit gunked up and it's hooking up, or perhaps your guide wheels, also known as the jockey wheels, perhaps they're not rotating properly and the chain actually derails off those, which in turn would put it off at the bottom of the chain ring. 
There are a few different ways it can happen, most of which can be traced back to a very specific thing. If you just spend a bit of time looking at it, it's not necessarily your bike's fault. Um, obviously bikes aren't, it's not, you're not supposed to pedal backwards, they're not designed to be pedaled backwards. However, you should be able to pedal backwards without the chain coming off. So it's usually one of those things. Short stems are best, like that one. Um, well, yeah, kind of. They are kind of the best, but also you can't just put a short stem on a bike and expect that bike to handle well. If your bike is a short bike and you put a shorter stem on it than it was designed for, arguably you're going to either ruin the handling or you're going to ruin the fit of the bike as you ride it, and neither of which are a good thing. Likewise, you can't just go the other way around. You can just put a long stem to make a short bike fit you because you're going to mess up the handling. The whole balance of the bike isn't going to work. This bike, for example, actually came out of the box with a 50 millimeter stem on it. It was designed for that length. I've got, by nature, quite a short upper body, but really long arms. That's why I run a full width bar and I run a slightly shorter stem. That's a 35 millimeter, um, but it kind of works out for me. It doesn't disrupt the handling of the bike. The bike is nice and long. There's a really long reach on this bike, so I don't have to worry about compromising position when I'm stood up out the saddle climbing, for example, or even seated. Uh, it works just right as it is. Uh, for example, my Canyon Lux, that's a cross-country bike. That's got an 80 millimeter stem. I've got a, uh, almost a negative rise, uh, it's flipped. And that's a very long stem compared to this 35 mil stem, but it's the correct length stem for that bike. It's the correct stem for the fit of the bike and for the way the bike is intended to be ridden. Um, and you can see that I'm riding it just fine here. Um, it's of course a cross-country bike. It's not supposed to be jumped and hammered around by putting a short stem on it. You're kind of changing what the bike's intentions actually are. So whilst a short stem may make a certain bike's handle well, it's gonna make others handle really badly. Coil shocks are better than air. Well, <laughs> that's, that's, where do we go with this? Where do we even start? Yeah, I've got a coil shock on here at the moment. I'm actually in the middle of trying to find that out myself but there's a load of factors that go into this. For example, does your weight vary when you're riding a bike? If you, say if you're a photographer and you ride with a heavy camera bag one day and the other day you don't, an air shock will probably be better for you because of the fact you can instantly adjust it to your weight immediately. With a core shock, you're stuck with that core spring on there, in which case you have to take it off, you have to take the spring off each time to change your spring weight. That's no good. And of course, you also have to factor in the most important thing of the difference, is the suspension curve at the back end of your bike. There's three kind of main traits you get. I'm not gonna get into all the leverage and all the stuff on bikes, but you'll get a falling rate design, a linear rate design, and a rising rate design. A rising rate design will work really well with a coil shock. A linear rate or a falling rate will not work very well with a coil shock. The reason for that, coil shocks by nature are very linear in action, and air shock is very progressive by action. It's that simple, really. One is not better than the other, you might prefer one, and one might suit certain bikes more, but there's no real better question there. On the upside, coil does offer an amazing feeling. It's really, really sensitive, really good for small bumps and stuff. However, that in itself can be very different to riding air. Air, you're very connected to the ground, you can feel it. Coil, sometimes, I think it's a bit like punching smoke. You can feel a little bit disconnected, but that might be right up your street. Oh, and of course, the last thing is um, how you actually ride. Um, coil shocks and coil forks by nature, they're really good in rough terrain. If you like plowing through stuff, they're gonna feel great. But if like me, you like to sort of dance around a bit on the trail, uh, maybe jump things and push into backsides, air shocks might feel better for you because there's a bit more support and they kind of uh, allow that sort of agile style of riding. They're two very different styles and they don't, neither one will actually suit all riders. So you have to pick what's best for you. And the last one, um, shock or fork lockout, you need it to go faster uphill. Um, not really, no. Um, how you pedal is actually how you're gonna go faster uphill. Of course, there are some factors that go into this. If your bike, for example, doesn't have much anti-squat, when you pedal, it's gonna mean you're gonna bob around a bit going up the hill. So although it's not gonna make you go any faster by having a lockout on there, it's definitely gonna be a lot more comfortable. And that might make you perceive, your perceived reaction be that you're actually going faster or it's slightly easier. You'd be surprised and the actual difference is not much in that. Uh, and for a fork, again, of course you can lock them out, you can keep them open. Uh, it's entirely up to you, but really it doesn't change how the bike is actually gonna ride. 
Honestly, if you're looking at this as an excuse to buy more kit, you don't need it. You can set your bike up accordingly. You can run it a bit firmer if you needed to. You could perfect spinning circles on the pedals uh, using a, you know, going a slightly higher cadence rather than just mashing those gears. Of course, as you mash through gears, naturally you use more body weight so the bike's going to bob up and down more. If you're spinning nice and neatly like a roadie, you're doing very little in disturbing the bike. So. Don't, don't think of it as you need to try new stuff on your bike all the time. Sometimes you might just need to fine tune what you're doing on the bike to go faster. Well, there you go. There's a few prime candidates there. In fact, another prime candidate would be uh, buying a bike by looking at a geometry chart. Now you might know your numbers, but do you know your numbers in combination to the dynamic geometry of the bike? How those things might change if your bike has high anti-squat? No, it changes everything. Uh, so don't buy a bike by looking at geometry chart, buy a bike by demoing the bike. That's how you wanna be doing it because you'll truly feel what the bike feels like. Uh, if I missed any, let us know if there's any other sort of conceptions, uh, bis you know, bad communication, misunderstandings in tech stuff on bikes. So uh, we'll pick up in another video. Uh, cheers for hanging around. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Cheers guys.